She looks she like looks an like agitated, agitated person. person. <laughs> I, I look like, like an even more agitated person. person. I'm sorry. I just, but you know, I just, it's all good. It's all good because you wrote the best book I've read probably in the okay. last two years. I We're live. We're live. Okay. Hey, everybody. Hi. Good afternoon. Sorry about And welcome to Books and Books and my only book page, Virtual Author Series. As you can see, we've had a few technical difficulties. Sorry. Thank you for bearing with us. We're still trying to work through these things, learning as we go. So, buenas tardes, bienvenido. This virtual author series is brought to you today in partnership with Miami Book Fair and Miami Dade College. Throughout the years, we've joined forces to present hundreds and thousands of authors to our community, and we're thrilled to be launching this series together for your virtual enjoyment. We're delighted to have you join us as we welcome a star in the literary universe, the great Julia Alvarez. Hola, Julia. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us from your home this afternoon. Julia's, Julia's new novel, Afterlife, is truly a gem. It's her first adult novel in 15 years, and it's published by our friends at Algonquin Books. Oprah calls it a gorgeously intimate portrait of an immigrant writer and recent widow carving out hope in the face of personal and political grief. Julia left the Dominican Republic to the United States in 1960 at the age of 10. He's the author of 10 novels. She's the author of six novels, three books of nonfiction, three collections of poetry, and 11 books for children and young adults. Until her retirement in 2016, she was a writer in residence at Middlebury College. Her work has garnered wide recognition, including a Latina Leader Award in Literature from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, the Hispanic Heritage Award in Literature, and Woman of the Year by Latina Magazine. In the Time of the Butterflies, with over one million copies in print, was selected by the National Endowment for the Arts for its National Big Read Program. And in 2013, President Obama, a president who understood good storytelling, awarded Alvarez the National Medal of Arts in recognition of her extraordinary work. Julia will be in conversation this afternoon with Books and Books' fearless leader, Mitchell Kaplan. Mitchell is the owner and founder of the independently owned Miami-based Books and Books, which was named Publishers Weekly Bookstore of the Year in 2015. He's a former president of the American Booksellers Association and in 2011 received the National Book Foundation's prestigious Literary Award for Outstanding Service to the American Literary Community. He's the co-founder of Miami Book Fair and a force in the literary world. Tune in to his weekly podcast, The Literary Life of Mitchell Kaplan. We're going to start the program this afternoon with a reading from Julia, followed by their conversation, and then we'll take select questions from the online audience. I can see that everyone has stuck with us I see you all here. So thank, thank you, and I, I, I just want to say a, a couple of words of welcome as well. Um, I want to welcome Julia, who I who always brightens a room, no matter how much tension there is prior to going on. I want to talk about how interesting live stuff is. I can only imagine what the days of live television must have been like. I want to thank everyone at the Miami Book Fair for making this happen. I want to thank Christina Nosti, our fearless uh, events coordinator, and Lisette, and everybody at Miami Book Fair, as well as Mochi, who's helping to kind of work this through. Mochi is an amazing social media company. Um, and I also want to thank you, all of you out there. I think there are over or close to 400 people out there. And I want to thank all of you for supporting us as an independent bookstore, supporting the literary world in this very, very difficult time. Um, and I know there are people from all over the country. So as independent bookstores are struggling everywhere and writers are having a hard time getting their voices out there, uh, we can't tell you how much we appreciate the fact that on a Sunday afternoon, you decide to spend a little bit of that time with us. And um, you're in for a huge treat. Uh, 
There's no one like Julia Alvarez. As many of you know, this is her first adult novel in many, many years. And um, it is, without a question, one of the most spectacular novels I've read in a very, very long time. So the way it's going to work is, as Christina told you, Julia is going to do a little bit of a reading, and then she and I are going to engage in a bit of a conversation. And then you guys will have a chance to ask some questions as well. Sound good? Okay, Julia, you're on. The book, the book is afterlife. The book is afterlife. This is it. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you so much. We've had some trouble, so I'm. I'm Mitch is on the phone with me because I can't hear him on the screen, and uh, we're going to do the best we can. But yes, thank you for sticking with us. Um, it's wonderful that you're there. I can't see you, but um, I feel you, and I want to thank um, everybody especially Mitch, who was there from the very beginning when Garcia Girls, my, de my debut novel, came out. And he welcomed me to Books and Books, which was huge for me. And he, he's been a supporter all along to many of us writers. So thank you, Mitch. And uh, just to put in a little pitch, too, I didn't know this. Uh, you find out a lot of things when you're um, uh, sheltering at home. But today is happy virtual Bookstore Day. Oh, it's, uh, terrific. April 25th. That's right. And I think right. the best way to celebrate today is to order a book um, either from Books and Books or your local independent bookstore uh, and take care of the booksellers that take care of our reading life and of us authors as well. So thank you. And thank you to all the hosts. I'm going to start because we're, we started a little late uh, with a reading. <laughs> And rather than introduce all kinds of people, I'm going to read from the very beginning, the prologue, which is called Broken English. And you're going to meet Antonia, and I think that's all you need to know. Broken English. She is to meet him, a place they often choose for special occasions, to celebrate her retirement from the college, a favorite restaurant, and the new life awaiting her, a half hour drive from their home, a mountain town, 20 if she speeds in the 30 mile zone. Tonight it makes more sense, a midway point, to arrive separately as she will be driving from her doctor's appointment. She gets there first as he will be driving from home. He should have been there before her. She starts calling his cell after waiting 10, 20 minutes. He doesn't answer. Irritation turns to worry, no surprise there always leaves it behind um, in his work jeans pocket, the hospital, 911, the police. Have you seen him? Or turns off the sound at the movies and then forgets to turn it back on. Can you please help me find him? Even now, months later, about six feet, thinning hair, a boy's blue eyes, when she knows good and well, dusk deepening, how he had been driving up the mountain, he feels a stab of pain, already thinking of what he might order, coming from his left side but radiating out, wondering about her state of mind, the special, if it is special, if she would be excited or terrified, or his default favorite, salmon with lemon dill sauce, like a sword piercing his left side, substituting mashed potatoes for the fries. They're very good about substitutions. Though how would he know what it feels like to have a sword piercing his left side? Because of his medical training, understanding what is happening, not wanting to cause more harm, pronounced dead on arrival. He forgets to charge it and it runs out of juice. Even now, three months shy of a year later, pulling his car off the road, rolling gently to a stop when she knows exactly what happened, a ditch that might as well be his grave discovered by a passing cyclist, rushed to the ER, why he was late, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, as he is to be cremated and therefore have no grave per se. Neither he nor she could have foreseen, even now, a boy's blue eyes and cannot comprehend how someone she loved. She keeps running and rerunning that night in her head. Can you please help me find him? Can be nothing but dust, Unread emails, fragments, unpaid bills, memories, 
broken glass, dented bumper, a new life awaiting her, both terrified and excited. How can it be? Can you help me find him? Tall with thinning hair, a new life awaiting her. Can you help me find him? A mystery she cannot by any means solve. Nevertheless, she keeps asking, where are you? As this is the only way she knows, can you help me find him? How to create an afterlife for him? Julia, that was beautiful. I'm sorry, I had to, I got a little distracted because the cell phone um, um, gives me noises. So I had to turn off yeah. the speaker, but now you're back on. I, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think what's happened is that, um, you know, there's rain in the Miami area. It's a lot of thunder and rain. And I think that's getting in the idea, that's getting in the way of certain things. But let's just dive in. Um, you know, um, basically, this has been a really rough time for everybody. How are you these days? How are things going? Where you, where you are. Tell me what Tell a little me bit what a life little has been life like has been sheltering like in, place, sheltering for in you. place for you. Well, we are definitely sheltering in, in place since March 20th. We haven't really been out. Uh, we're, we're that demographic, a surprise. We're, we're the elders they keep talking about. So we have to be careful. Um, uh, my husband is uh, has a, a lung condition, so we I have to be very careful and can't take any risks. But you know, yesterday we went into the woods to take a forest bath. You're in and you're in Vermont, there. right? You're in Vermont. We're in Vermont, right? And you know, it's a big deal in Vermont when spring comes. And we found um, some uh, trout lilies in the woods, and we forage and have a big, huge basket of fiddlehead ferns. And uh, on the road, um, there's a there's a, a big purple heart somebody painted and a sign that says, thank you, truckers. And we get calls and messages, people, can we pick up something for you? So I just feel like it has been um, an incredible, um, tragic time as we hear the news and hear our friends that succumb. Uh, and at the same time, there are these, you, you really cherish these things that were normally too busy. Uh, to see and know and, and community build. So in that way, Mitch, it's, it's, it's been a good thing. And, you know, sad for the book that it's coming out at, at you know, born under a, a dark star. But given the things that are going on out there, it's a very small disappointment. Um, well, so, in, in, many, in ways, many ways, you know, I mean, you know, as I, I mean, said as before, I, I love this, this book, book. And, and I loved and it I loved on it. so many That's different cool. levels. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do an annotated version of this at some point, because it it's the culmination of so much of what you've taught over the years as well. You have so much poetry in it and so much philosophy in it, things that I, I, I walked away with being, you know, envy the students in your classes who got to learn some of these things that you wrote about. And as I say, it's it's on so many levels so beautiful. And I hope we'll get to some of that this afternoon. Um, at the same time, as you can tell from what you just heard, those out there, there's a compelling narrative. It starts off with the death of, of a husband, of um, Antonia's husband. And um, I don't want to give anything away. I'm going to try to stay away from spoilers because there are so many things that go on but um the book stays with somebody in a way that not a lot of narratives do but one and and when you talk about it being a dark time what's so interesting and we can talk a little bit about it is that afterlife could be about this time as well in so many ways i know you didn't plan for this none of us did but in in thematically, it fits right into what we're doing. And one of the things I wanted to start out by asking you is that after so many years, you've written poetry, you've written books for adults, you've written books for kids, you've written so many different things. Why afterlife and why now? What is the, the how did that, how did it come to be? Um, what, one of the things 
I'm going to turn the speaker off because it, it blares my voice. But um, one of the things that, that I can say about, you know, hearing from my publisher when, when I got the description, her first novel in 15 years, and I thought, wow, but I've been writing. I think that part of it was that it was um, that I that I had to integrate things uh, and write from this point in my life. I, I call this my first novel as an elder. And I think that I, um, you know, in my own life, I was wondering what does it mean to be an elder storyteller? What does it mean to be at this stage of life? What, do, what are the stories I have to tell before I go? And these aren't things that are instantly apparent. And I didn't just want to repeat the things that I had learned and the things that I knew I could do um, or thought I knew I could do. I wanted it to be, um, I, I wanted it to be accurate. That's really one of the things I was after. I wanted it to be accurate um, to something that I had to build the root system for in my own life and in my own psyche. So there is that that it takes a while, at least for this kind of a writer, where the life and the work, the, li the work is the practice, the calling, and therefore they're, they're deeply, deeply connected. And I couldn't write the book that I didn't yet know how to write. And I don't mean just with my, with my smarts up here or my brain. Um, so there was that. And I think in terms of how it sort of eerily resonates with this time, I think that writers, um, part of what we do, Henry James said that, you know, the, the, that the advice to a young writer was be him or her, I'm adding her, be him or her on whom nothing is lost. We're picking things up all the time in the site, guys. We're, we're picking things up. We're, we're um, learning. And I think there was, we're living in a time of, of loss. I call it elegiac time, you know, a time where so many things are, we're losing so many things, species, climate change, uh, the lack of a civil society, gun violence, divisiveness, draconian immigrant. We were watching the, the breakdown of things. And I think as a writer, you're absorbing that. And it's not that you write directly to what you're absorbing. It can be a story over here, but that kind of, uh, you know, like a gas under the door, it comes in and it's part of what, composes you as you as you compose. So I think that was that was part of what was going on. You know, one of the one of the technical problems we're having is that I can't hear you. So I'm, I'm hearing you a little bit and reading your lips as you give the answers. So maybe if you just turn your I can hear you now, but if you just turn your speaker down a little so it doesn't get in your way when you talk, I'll be able to hear some of your answers too. But that was that was really wonderful. Could you give a broad and without giving away much? Could you give a broad narrative outline of the book itself? <laughs> because I was given the task um, to um, to write a, a twenty second uh, version of the novel. <laughs> so here it is. It, it's not going to give you much plot, but the way it goes is she retired to the good life and found herself in a wasteland. She went out to dinner with her husband and came home a widow. She closed herself up in the past and found the future in her garage. She fled her familia and rediscovered her sisters. She failed to save others and touched bottom in her heart, which allowed her to help others. This is the best afterlife any of us can have before we die. And then I say for the novel version of the story, read afterlife. So is that, is that a, enough of a summary? That is a perfect uh, summary perfect without giving summary. away right. too, much too much at all. Much at all. And, right. and, and, and you know, as you, as you talk about this, the thing, as I read it, what was so striking was the setup that you gave in the first, that first bit about you know, the loss of the husband in here. Um, what you write about grief and you write about meaning in life and all of that is um, so eloquent and so stunning 
that it becomes kind of the whole book has become becomes a meditation. And so I was very curious that you began the book with T.S. Eliot and you ended it with T.S. Eliot as well. Can you talk about why you did that in relation to the book being a meditation on old age, on grief, on all that sort of thing? All of that sort of thing. Again, you know, when I talk, it's easy to sound like I'm, you know, very smart and planned it all out and knew all of this. Um, you know, it's a book that I that I composed, and I very much wanted to do one thing formally before before I go, which was to write a short, um, intense lyrical novel. I, I really admire that Japanese form whereby you strip things away, that sensibility, Japanese sensibility, you strip things away in order to charge what remains. And so I was really working these little pieces of the story, which at the very beginning you see are all broken apart. That's why it's called broken English. And so to me, um, very much T.S. Eliot is a poet of the wasteland. Um, but also a poet in the four quartets, which by the way, I read every January. I've been doing it now for almost 15 years. It's a ritual. In January, I read the four quartets because it's very much um, how to, uh, it's very much moving through the wasteland, which he's very famous for, but then the, he reaches a, a kind of spiritual resonance and greatness in that huge, wonderful poem. So, um, so I wanted, you know, I wanted um, I wanted to use this uh, string in my labyrinth of storytelling. I wanted it to follow that, and um, and so he is, you know, I, I start out with a with a quote um, at the very beginning from um, Little Gidding from the way, from the Four Quartets, and I end with uh, the blessing uh, that comes at the end of the wasteland, and um, so I, I wanted that. Um, I wanted that form, form of using one of my one of my guides and masters. That right? Can you hear? Okay. Now I can't hear you. You can't hear me now. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Turn up your volume a little. Hello. Did we lose Julia? I Hello. Can't. Can... Now I can't hear you. Hello. Put... Can you hear me now? You're gone. But is, am I on the phone with you? Let me call you up again. This is this is wild. I know. I'm. I apologize for everybody out there, but we will we will have it down after a few of these. So I am calling her again. Hi, Mitch. I lost you, even on the phone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. So so the piece at the end from Elliot is from the Upanishad. So that that little blessing at the end, it take, yeah, would you say it again? Chanti, right. yes. And, right. And, that and, and that takes a work, a work of, of um, um, you know, a work of, of, of contemporary angst, and it moves it into something, it, it kind of makes it more, um, it, it kind of fills it out and makes it to be more of a lesson that one is to learn. And I think that's what we find this book doing. It takes us from the beginning of this death, of this, this clearly loving marriage where the husband dies, and it takes you all the way through the various stages of grief that, 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 um, that the main character has. And in, in between, you don't only deal with Elliot, but you deal with Rumi, you deal with, with, with Auden, you deal with haiku. You have this marvelous, marvelous haiku. Even Kyoto, hearing the cuckoos cry, I long for Kyoto. That was something that I had not really known before, and it was just so, so beautiful. Wordsworth, uh, Tolstoy, Rilke on death, the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it's all in there in this very slim volume. How were you able to distill your years worth of reading and teaching 
and select those particular elements. What did you use to make those selections in order to describe what grief could be? I don't think that, um, you know, I, I don't think it was a strategy. I think it was just, um, you know, of course, Antonia, um, you know, inherits all the DNA <laughs> of, of, um, of her author, um, her literary DNA. And so these, these phrases, these, um, these iconic, uh, as I call them, string uh, through the labyrinth, which Antonia has been using all her life. And they're kind of like um, the ways that she understands and makes meaning, her, her, com her compassion, uh, her engine for empathy, her, it's just how she runs, you know, this is her gasoline. But one of the things that I wanted to strip away from her, um, because that's true dark night of the soul, is that sometimes that's not going to be enough. Right. As much as she has used these things and tries desperately to find her way with their guidance, she, that is not, it fails her. Sometimes life is going to demand more from her than words. And this is a chastening for her. You know, um, this is, I mean, this is the last thing, you know. Uh, I wanted to sort of write a contemporary book of Job with a Latina main character and with a sense of humor. And, <laughs> both. And you did both. And, you did a, so you have to straight, you know, Job, everything gets stripped away from Job. He right. doesn't get to keep anything. You That's, know? True. Uh, That's true. And so what happens at that moment, uh, you know, where you're a bare forked animal on, on you know, on the, uh, on that heath in King Lear, you know, what happens when all of that falls away? What, where do you touch bottom? You know, and this is, in fact, you know, why I think ultimately it's a hopeful book um, because, spoiler alert, she does touch bottom, not where she expected, not, um, you know, not an easy plunge, but she does touch bottom. She, find, she, she finds, finds her bearing. bearing. She does she find does her bearing. bearing. Yeah. But what... Bottom in her heart which allowed her to help others. There, so, there, there's a, you know, all of us, and this is about consciousness, I guess. We all walk around with that tape running in our head, right? That tape that nobody else can hear. What this book did, and I guess I personalized it or I projected it onto you as the author, but it gave me an insight into what, that, what the sound of that tape was like in someone like like an English teacher in Vermont at Middlebury College, even though it's not Middlebury College, right? But, but it gave me that insight into someone who is completely immersed in the word, who every reference that they have comes from literature of one sort or another. And that was the guiding light for this character, th those words. And when you say she came out at the end, would you talk a little bit about what she found at the end. There's that wonderful line that you have about um, what happens when you're when you're between those two dangerous. You know, what do you rely on? You were asking. You were saying, I wonder what Sam would say when you were between. Is it Scylla and I forget the other monsters that? Yes. What do yeah, you, and, uh, how do you yeah, make the decision? Yeah. What do you rely on? You and rely I love, on? I love the answer to I that. Love the answer to that. Do you remember? Um, do you remember? Had something to do with love. Had something to do with love. Well, I I must have I must have missed that. No, no, it's, <laughs> no, where, no. You say, it's where you say you say, and I wrote it here somewhere, where you say that. How do you make the right decision? And you basically say you follow what will you follow you you act because of love. Do you know what I mean? That's what I... you know. This is the where we touch bottom. You know um, that love. And when we were talking before about uh, you know the pandemic and so forth, I think that's why a lot of us are meeting each other. We've touched bottom uh, in the heart and. I guess the thing, the reason I was a little 
you know, unsure of how to answer it is because one of the things um, that Antonia finds, and, and with this character, I especially wanted, um, I didn't want to be, I didn't want a character that um, was serving me. I wanted, I wanted a character that was smarter than me. I wanted a character, and I wanted to be totally accurate to the nuances and complexities, you know. And so one of the things is that there are no answers, you know. Um, that is, it is about being present and having the questions. Um, and then, as you pointed out, you know, in that, in that openness, which is painful because you want, you want a set of answers, you know, you want a little, you want to have a, a rule of life, you know, but, but no, you know, to live in that uncertainty and to be present in that moment and to, yeah, to think with your heart, to, to let that guide you. Um, and, and that means, that doesn't mean just, oh, you make the really big hearted decision. Some people would want Antonia to do something else than what she does with um, undocumented workers she's asked to help. But, but you know, she, it, it's a balance of being true because see, I think the way we really serve in, in our lives is if we serve with what we love, if we serve dutifully or out of some ideology, we're, we're abstracted. And I wanted it to be that we serve, I, I wanted for her um, to serve with what you're passionate about. That is the greatest activism when you're able to do that, to serve with what you love, which might be writing, which might be having a garden. It doesn't mean that you're at the front lines, although I think more and more we're having to find out that all of us have to become that kind of activist too. But it's about serving with, with your passion because that's what you were put here to do. And if you bring that to the table, you're bringing love to the table. And how can that hurt? That's how the beloved community gets created. You know, I learned so much from this book uh, and it codified so much of what I feel. And in this, this time of loss, and so many of us have lost so many, uh, even maybe even really bef even before this virus hit, you write about an afterlife and you say this, what if anything does it mean in afterlife? All she has come up with is that the only way not to let the people she loves die forever is to embody what she loved about them. What a beautiful way of thinking. Going round and round about the title, which I, this was my title and I, I held on to it like a dog with a bone, but one of the things that I wanted, um, I, I, you know, we people, uh, publisher, of course, worries that maybe people would think it's, you know, um, a religious tract or something. But to me, that is what the, the afterlife means. That the afterlife she could create for Sam is to embody those things she loved in him. And then not all of him dies. And so that's part of, you know what I mean by an afterlife, as well as, as well as um, the fact that, as we see with this character throughout the novel, even within any of our lives, there are many little deaths. If we're lucky, if we're resilient, um, we come back. We have a life after, we have an afterlife after those little deaths, and hopefully um, there'll be even bigger versions of our former lives. Uh, if we stay open and um, and lead with a heart, <laughs> so yeah, it's um, afterlife is very much um, about cre about embodying those things that you learn about the characters that she's lost and is losing. There was also there was something, also about, something it, which, about it, with which again you pointed out in a way that was so elegant, and that is the the fear that we all walk around with all the time and 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 which it's the fear which guides us and you you actually start i think it's your first chapter the first name chapter which is here there be dragons right which is a reference to the idea that on the old maps when it was like at the end of the world it was always like here there be dragons and no right. universe. So, yeah. so 
this basic so fear this is basic what we're all dealing fear with. Is what we're all and dealing with. The way we construct our lives is, in essence, trying to make sense out of that, what that fear really is, which is our, really our mortality. And as all those of us get to be of a certain age, that does become, you know, an over, you know, when I think about where I'll be in 15 years and how old that'll make me, it's very frightening to a large extent. So we have to deal with all of those things. And I'm sure that that's something that you, and I know that's something you confronted here. So what I want to do is just throw out a couple of, couple of highlights of this novel for me and let you just, the first thing that comes to mind, you refer a lot to the book of the anonymous. You want to talk a little bit about what that means to you, to you the book of the, the, book anonymous. Of the anonymous? Oh, the, uh, this, this book that, it, that if she ever gets back to her writing, Antonia is going to write about actually, Mitch, about what we're hearing about all the time now. Thank you, truckers, essential workers, all of a sudden your garbage man. Where would we be without him? The delivery person, the person stocking, stocking in a grocery store. And this is something that intrigues Antonia. All the, all the uh, sort of invisible, anonymous people that really are behind the big, important things that happen and, you know, the front people that are supposedly responsible. And uh, the book of the anonymous is also, of course, you know, so much um, a legacy of, of women and uh, female writers. So many of them were anonymous, you know, they, 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 weren't, they didn't have voices. Uh, they, they were storytellers, they were weavers, they were quilters, they were chefs, they were mothers, you know, they did all the, <laughs> work of civilization. So Antonia is very taken with, um, you know, these people to get the work done, including all the undocumented migrant workers that are doing all the milking in all the dairy farms around her. And, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the beautiful dairy uh, idyllic image of Vermont is carried on their backs, but nobody sees them, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, reminded so, me, it reminded me a little of when you read about what Williams was trying to do in some of his early poetry. You know, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chicken. So much depends on the average, everyday kind of common thing. And it has the same thing to do with, with people. History is made up of that. It's not made up of just big, huge events that go on. Um, talk also about, and this, this you write about all the time, but in this book particularly, it's quite prevalent, but talk about the sisterhood. Well, uh, I, no, no surprise if you look back over, and now I have, you know, a long history behind me of, 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 um, of uh, footprints in what I've written. I've written, I've always been interested in sisters, starting with the Garcia girls than the Mirabar sisters, and also with the bond between women, because even saving the world, even though it's not about blood sisters, it's about two soulmates over um, two different periods of history, but um, one of them finds the other, and one of them in, in the past, a historical figure imagines the other. So um, sisterhoods have always been important to me. I come from a family of all sisters, so for me, my, and, and you know, I come from a culture too, a Latino culture, a, a familia culture, where it's never just about me, but about we. And you know, um, when you grow up in this, in this um, coven of sisters, it's almost like you're not a whole person unless all of you are together, but not, not to make that, uh, you know, this really, oh, wonderful, what a bond. It also means, uh, trouble because there's there's the need for I who are you in this um, sisterhood and it's so easy also because one of the things that the book is concerned with is the gated communities we put ourselves in whether like you say it's you know the dragons are all out there and you defend yourself by having a gated community of your tastes your reading life your friends your whatever the sisterhood and, you know, part of it is I wanted to show, you know, I wanted to get out of those gated communities um, that we build, those, um, 
those those deals we make with each other that don't allow us to you know be present in a relationship we, we sort of close it down so that's part of what i was um i mean the sisters are very important uh so it, very, so it, yeah go ahead i'm sorry I was going to say, so it begs the question, particularly with this line, and actually one sister says this to Antonia. She says, basically, uh, she's putting her down and saying, yeah, you're a blabbermouth, a blabbermouth author spilling everyone's beans in the family and calling it fiction. So it begs the question, how much of all of this is autobiographical? I know you didn't lose your husband, thankfully, but where is some of this? <laughs> you said, you killed me in the first chapter, and I said, it's fixed. <laughs> he, says it, he says it jokingly, but let, let me say this, Mitchell, because I think it's, it's it's tricky, and I understand I understand a family's point of view. It's no fun having a writer in the family, especially one that, as I've described myself, I you know I'm a I'm a writer that very much the life and the work are so interconnected. I don't even know where that shoreline. It's a shifting shoreline. Um, but I think you know I was once on a panel with Julia Glass, and you know she was on the panel. We each had, got our little roles in the panel. I supposedly wrote autobiographical fiction and she wrote fiction fiction you know really invented fiction and she said hey guys let me tell you this all fiction even fiction fiction is emotionally autobiographical right the right. reason you go to that subject the reason you have that character the reason you have that situation is because there's some there's juice in it for you you know um so that i think that all novels operate with that with those kinds of um, connections between the author and her characters. That said, and I, I really have to emphasize this, is that even though my um, my fiction might come has a you know a biological parents in my life, I'm not interested in 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 being. In, in telling a memoir, in telling all. I, I am not interested really in Julia Alvarez, but she is the only apparatus I have for learning about the world and gathering the information and being present in the world. And I use it to create a narrative and what I don't need, even if it really happened, I throw out. And what works, I keep in. So I sure I you know some as Julia Glass said all fiction is emotionally autobiographical and the membrane between the life and the work seems to be thinner for me who knows why maybe because I come from an oral tradition maybe because I come from a tradition where um, the storyteller is part of a community so the idea that I would have a story to tell that has nothing to do with the community. <laughs> Somehow, I can't explain it, you know? Um, it, it doesn't, I, I, I've written stories like that and they don't live. Yeah, no, well, I, this, guess, this will live. It doesn't get in there. This will, but, um, this will live for a know. long, long time. And, you know, the other thing which I found really heartening is there was one line that you have in it where it says, Antonia reads prose as if it is poetry. And, you know, it's sort of the way I, I read. I'm a very slow reader. And it's really about reading. Talk then, talk a little bit about your connection to the written word that way. I mean, I read it for the beauty of language and what it says and how I can, how I can get deeper than just the word on the page. I think, I think I'm partly dyslexic so i me too I have to be very very slow you know slowly and i think because i was trained in poetry i i pay attention to every word um this is why it's so hard for me to blurb books because i actually read the whole thing and i read it very slowly so it's it's difficult but i think it's also um i have, I have trouble with reading i can't read on a device because um a device puts me in hyper time 
instead of um, deep reading, you know, uh, instead of um, contemplative time. And so I, I read, I, I enter that world when I'm reading. So I don't know how to do it. I don't, I never knew how to speed read. And so this is the way that I write too. And why I'm constantly revising because it's as if I'm writing a poem and a word doesn't sound right uh, or the syntax of a sentence or the flow of a paragraph or the rhythm of a chapter. And I'm, you know, I'm paying attention to those things. And so, you know, sometimes I wish I could just get the bang the story down, but, but I can't do that. You know, it's part of my handicap, maybe having started as a poet or, or maybe it's just my sensibility. You know, it's, it's the way that I, um, that I put together. Reality. Well, one of, one of yeah. Antonia's, yeah. Poems, Antonia's even poems even makes it into the book. And I, I, at least two lines of it, which I really, I really love. It's called, we may, it, it goes, we make the spirit out of what we own. No angel lives abroad, but in the bone. It reminds me so much of people like uh, Miller Williams, you know, where the spirit meets the bone, you know, that sort of thing. And that was such a beautiful two lines. But I also then want to get to this idea because a good part of the book does deal with what, what's happening in the news. I mean, you can't say anything more than that. Not today, but at the time you were writing, you were writing it. I mean, the whole idea of undocumented uh, folks and the, you know, you you do something so unique and so beautiful that you take away all stereotypes in the way you handle this. The fact that it is in Vermont, not a lot of people think about it that way. It, it opens a lot of people's eyes. Um, um, talk about that. And then I'm also interested if you talk a little bit about because you live amongst them, what Sheriff Boyer meant. The whole idea of Sheriff Boyer, these these guys who are kind of clueless, but yet they support, you know, they are right wingers, but yet, you know, their heart seems to be in the right place. That's we talked about this a little earlier with gated communities. Part of the thing um, that Antonia, um, you know, I bring into her life is um, the way that we, uh, I just, I think she, the phrase she uses is, uh, you know, uh, her, uh, thrust someone down our othering chute, you know, oh, he's a, you know, he, he's a right winger, uh, white sheriff, he's, you know, and she, she's, you know, very alert and wary, but it turns out that she, one of the things that I think Antonia learns is to grant others the same complexity and nuance are, as herself, that there are no others, you know, that there is this person and that person. So, yeah, the Sheriff Boyers, um, the, um, the farmer next door, you know, uh, whom she already has in this, in this little, you know, in this little uh, label and, uh, you know, and, and to sort of, that's what I meant before about meeting the reality uh, with an open heart, you know, and suddenly discovering, hey, but I also wanted it in another way. I wanted to tweak this idea that she's Latina, you know, and right. therefore everybody assumes she's married to this white guy and they think, and who's kind of very political and vocal about it. And everybody assumes, oh, she's changed him. She's, you know, right. it's because right. of this, and she's actually the reluctant activist. Right. She's the one holding back. So I wanted that too, you know, that there isn't one kind, even if um, you're in a certain demographic, there isn't a one kind of that kind either. And part of the true diversity is to grant other people full diversity. Um, it's not just, you know, ethnic diversity. You're in that demographic and therefore you're this homogeneous kind of person, you know, a full diversity. And for her to grant that to herself, you know, that she has to accept that complexity in herself too. Yeah. She had to find her immigrant toolkit somewhere way down below. She had to be there. She had to find it somehow, which she, which she does. And I just want to, I'll, I'll end my questions with you with just a, 
a, a statement from the book, which, which I really, which kind of blew me away where, where, and I'm forgetting where it comes from, actually, it might be from somebody else, but it may be from one of the poets you talk about, or it might be right from you, but you, you say pessimism would be an ethical catastrophe. We have to live as if, in other words, by metaphor. And I, I'm forgetting where that comes from, but, but I came from you. It's just beautiful. Well, sometimes I, I think I've invented a character, and somebody comes up and says, "Hey." Well, you named. I said that to you at a dinner party. But you named the whole chapter. Ooh, you the named whole the whole chapter, chapter as if. Chapter as if. So you were as actually if. thinking of metaphor. To live by metaphor, yeah. And I think so much of hope, um, and so much of living in our time is that, it, it's a luxury. It's an entitlement to despair. We we can't do that. We, we can't do that to the generations coming after us. We have to live as if it will matter that we show up, you know, that we protest, that we sign a petition. We have to, we have to live as if, even if this wonderful line from Wendell Berry that did not find its way into the book, amazingly, is from a poem of his called, um, manifesto the mad farmers liberation front and there's a wonderful line in it and it's um be joyful although you have considered all the facts oh, that's be that's joyful funny. though you have considered all the facts you know and the last line of that poem is practice resurrection uh, practice uh, resurrection i could have put that at the end of this um and it's it's these days it's yeah. not these days it's not very easy to do either of those things. As if, Mitch, as if. Right, as if. And you also and it also ends beautifully with the broken plate that gets put back together as well. I, I have to say, Julia, we'll go to questions. We'll take some questions if you don't mind. But um, I just have to encourage everybody to read this book. It to me, it's the book of the year. Um, it it's it's you know, you know what i want to do and we'll, talk, do, about we'll talk about this offline i'd love to get your reading list that would accompany this book of all of the people that you mentioned i'd love to i'd love to get a sense of them <laughs> no way. yeah well i'll put in i'll put in some requests and you can tell me where you know where i should go yeah. to find some of them and i can also if anybody is interested in that's a question that comes up uh, some of the books I'm reading, and I'm really trying very hard to give, um, you know, to, to read books by authors uh, of books that are coming out like my own in, in this time. Well, let's start with that. Coming out in a very difficult. Let's start. Moment. Let's start with that. What are some of the books that you're reading? Well, um, some of them aren't right right this moment, but a beautiful book that I really encourage uh, people to read is. Um, I don't quite know how to pronounce her name. Quay Mai is her first name, The Mountain Sing, and it's a debut novel, which is also hard, not just, um, you know, that it's coming out at this time, but it's a debut novel, somebody who's been working for years and has the, uh, the possibility to break through, and, and this is the moment that the book is born. But it's, again, what we were talking about with female um, female storytellers that have um, traditionally been, historically been anonymous. This tells the Vietnam mm. history story of the 20th century from a grandmother and a granddaughter's oh. point of view. Oh. So it's a beautiful um, saga, you know, reminds me of um, a novel like Pachinko. Um, it's very uh, riveting. It's, it's difficult, uh, but again, um, it, the beautiful connection uh, between these um, this grandmother and 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 the and the granddaughter is wonderful. Um, I just um, have been reading my dear friend. Oh, of course, of course. isn't this that story? an amazing? What a great collection that is! Oh my gosh, this is this woman is an amazing storyteller, and I, you know I I kind of want to feel especially proud because. Uh, our two little countries share an island. They don't always know they do. Uh, and one tries to 
especially my side of it, um, tries to butt the other one out, but um, a beautiful, beautiful book by an amazing storyteller. Um, I just also uh, finished Dish Jen. This came uh, out at the end of last year, a wonderful novel. I didn't, it's not my type of novel, you know, again, I went outside the gated community of my taste. A dystopia that's really, uh, that li that ends on as if. It, it actually has a very hopeful, um, utopian, uh, uh, buoyant quality to it. So I love it. I'm now reading A Paragon. Column oh, column. how was that? That is, it's... that is an amazing book. I really, I, I just... It, it tells a story in a way that I has never. I've it's never a story seen of before. story of the Middle East, Middle East story of yeah. Palestinians and Israelis. Two, yeah, Palestinian and Israeli dad. Each one has lost a daughter. Right. And right. Uh, but it's just it, it just fans out and becomes huge. It's just a, a huge compassionate. Um, you know, I, I I say that one of the things I love about stories is that with stories you exercise the novels of um the the muscles of the of that are the same muscles as for compassion you know becoming the other using the imagination to enter another sensibility um and so i think it's the same muscles um when you read that you can engage in as when you're compassionate and it is a novel that will exercise and broaden. It's a, a hugely beautiful um, novel. I just finished Ted Chiang, Book of Stories, Exhalation. Mm -hmm. Another book that wouldn't have been one that I would pick up, but I read the first story and one of my favorite um, stories, my, my um, muse is Shahrazad of the Arabian Nights. Mm -hmm. And it starts out with a, not, with a tale that's very much like the Arabian Nights, so I got swept in. Wonderful storyteller. Um, but maybe we should move. I, I can go through my whole. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you can go through your library. Right. But, I better but, stop. What, but what but I will I'm tell reading you. right now, I do want to say, I'm reading, it's coming out early May. You can put in a book order. Oh, um, fantastic oh, one, collection. Yes. Natalie um, Diaz's Postcolonial Love Poem. Um, wonderful book of poems. And I, I've just started reading and um, am really loving John Free, Freeman's Don uh, book is coming out in early May called The Park. Yeah. And it's amazing. It's a, a wonderful book. So um, th that's enough. Um, Two commercials before we go to questions. One, if you look on your screen, there is a little green button there where you can buy Afterlife by Julia. If you want to do it, it takes you right to our website and we will get it to you ASAP and there's free shipping involved. And um, secondly, I have a podcast called uh, The Literary Life and many of the authors that Julia mentioned were on that podcast. So you can find that wherever podcasts are, are done. And in fact, this, there's John's book. Yeah, John is w wonderful. Yeah, I know. I and Stuart uh, Bernstein uh, just surprised me. Ordered it from our local independent bookstore, and I opened the front door, and there's a bag with a book inside. Uh, delivered. I mean, what what bookstore? The owner comes and puts a book at your door. So this one is wonderful too. Anyhow, I'm not. Well, I guess the bar's been raised. So any of you living in Miami, I'll be happy to 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 deliver any books you want. Just email me directly. Uh, I know, but I'll come by. I promise. But anyway, you can buy you can buy Julia's book there. You can listen to our podcast. Or if you want to know more about these events, go to uh, booksandbooks.com or Miami Book Fair. And we are now partnering a whole bunch of stuff together. So you'll be able to hear about all the great stuff that we're doing. Uh, is if Christina's there, do you want to go through the questions, Christina? Christina. I think, I think you, you were gathering, gathering up, the, up questions. the questions. Can you hear and me? I can't hear can Christina, hear so Christina. I'll have, I can't either. You can't either. Can't hear. <laughs> anybody okay. hear? Well, maybe okay. I'll ask well, maybe some I'll of the questions that I see. Christina, we can't hear you. 
This is part of what our problem is. How about Just to give you an idea, Christina's in the Keys, I'm in Miami, and Julia's in Vermont. So we're really... Oh, oh my... Uh, so what is the question? Christina, you want to ask a question? Can you hear me? All right, Julia. Can you hear me? The audience hears hears Christina, but there is a delay. Julia, are you able to hear? All right. Anyway, I, there are some questions that came up that I saw coming through, and somebody asked a question about what it was like living as a Latina in Vermont. I'm sure you get that a lot, but. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I always uh, joked that um, I, when I came here, that I was in the Latina compromised state of Vermont. Um, because I think in the census in the year 2000, there were, I, in the year 2000, there were, I don't know, uh, you know, a couple of thousand Latinos in all of Vermont. And so it was very strange. By the same token, in the last 15 years, we have had an influx of undocumented workers that do most of the milking and most of the small farms that are going bankrupt and can't afford, can't find help and can't afford, you know, the, paying all the health insurance and things to workers. And so all of a sudden, just in my little county, there's 500 undocumented um, workers in this area. So it, it's, it's been a very strange um, Latinizing of Vermont because it's not really out there. You know, it's under a layer, a cloak of invisibility. Um, so it has been, but by the same token, uh, it has been uh, kind of lonely here. Uh, you know, I don't hear Spanish. Um, you know, I don't um, have my culture here. So it's kind of a schizophrenic thing. It's when I leave that that has happened for me. So by the same token, it's forced me to find um, uh, the Latinos and other people in a way. You know, it's, it's forced me to find um, commonality uh, in order to have community. And I've discovered a very... Um, friendly and, um, you know, I, as I say, I, I'm so glad I come from the Bernie state <laughs> to show my politics. You know, I, it, it, there's just a hands-on um, old rural values and a sense of community that I've found here that is very touching and very welcoming, you know. Someone's asking, Someone's asking um, um, which young Latina writers working today would you recommend for someone who's an ardent reader of Latin American and Latino and Latina short stories and novels. Just um, was interviewed um, in, at an event by somebody that I think is now based in Miami. <coughs> yes. He's, she's a yes. wonderful writer, uh, Ordinary Girls. I really, um, I really recommend her. Uh, what other ones? Andy Cruz, another, uh, uh, Dominican writer uh, who I'm very excited about. Uh, oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, and of course, you know, when I have to think without having, um, I wrote down a list at some point because um, my mind is not what it used to be and I, I lose the names. But I, I, that's something, uh, Mitch, that I can later send okay, you well. my, my list because there's so many and you know, I'm, I'm so excited because part of what it means, as I said to Sandra Cisneros recently, um, reading some of these writers, I said, um, Ada Limon, wonderful poet, Ada Limon, um, Natalie Diaz, yes. also yes. Native American. Um, but part of what I feel, we were, Sandra and I were talking about how it feels like, you know, when we came of age, it was like multiculturalism when we came of age as writers, 
multiculturalism hadn't been discovered <laughs> you know, true. in the mainstream. And we were living in a pre-multicultural world. And, you know, it's been a, it's been a, a batalla. And, you know, we, we're, very, we're very aware that we were at the front lines and had amazing helpers like Susan Burkholz, yeah. our agent, yeah. who really got, you know, who was out there sending our books out and so forth. And so I feel like one of the gratifying things uh, now that I'm an elder, is to look and see this wonderful talent, this wonderful, I mean, young writers that are getting it at such young ages and are such terrific writers. And I'm very, you know, it's very heartening um, to feel that. Like, you know, I said, the seeds we, the seeds we sowed are, are blossoming. And you know, they I, are I, see that, I, I see that as a bookseller as well. As well. And, it's kind of like the shoulders, the shoulders that we stand on, and and they're young right. And the beautiful thing about young writers is they recognize that, and they and they and they and they, you know, they they acknowledge that completely. Here's somebody who's asking, if you have any writing rituals, do you you know what helps inspire you to write? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, the land of Santeria and rituals and ceremony. Uh, you know, this is so much a part of the culture. Absolutely, I have my rituals. You know, I, I met, I've mentioned some poetry books because I always like to start the day early. I don't want to be on email. I don't get, I don't want to be on the phone. I, I start, I, you know, I like that liminal between the dream and the life stage where, you know, you brought some of that stuff with you. So I start the day with poetry. Because to me, poetry is, um, it, it, it immediately enters me out of the hyper time into that deep time, into that reflexive time, where language is at the cutting edge of where language becomes silence. So yes, I love to start um, the day with, uh, with, um, with poetry. You know, I have, um, you know, my little altar and and the people that um, are my are my muses and my guardians and uh, they shift, but certain ones are bedrock like Shahrazad. You know, um, so yeah, I have the you know clear water, um, anything you know, anything that is going to um, release uh, the whole of all these other things that can come you, in. You also have a meditative also practice, have a meditative right? Practice, you also... Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I... Meditation, uh, my meditation practice has become really important and was very difficult. And it's always difficult. I, I haven't... It's not every, every session, because I'm such a word person and such an image person and such a person that has a lot of, you know, walk around like like Antonio with a lot of famous people in my head talking to me, you know, T.S. Eliot. Yeah. Yeah. My problem is problem always, always, I feel like I'm alone, alone with my own my thoughts, thoughts and then I yeah. get scared and I go, I don't want to be alone with my own thoughts. <laughs> you know, I want to be alone with somebody else's thoughts. <laughs> so, so someone so, else is so asking, you know, some of your other you books know, have made it in Spanish. Do you plan Spanish. for this one to have a Spanish release anytime soon? I've been translated. Oh, um, it has. Great. But, uh, yep. My agent, Stuart Bernstein, has um, been really on it. And it will be coming out not till, I think, the fall of 2022. Okay. Um, okay. It was translated... Um, Oh my goodness, uh, Mercedes Gould. Okay, beautiful. Uh, okay, beautiful. But with a second set of eyes. Great. Ruth Herrera, Dominican. Great. Because you know our little Spanishes are different. They're, oh, and you. And she's got to sound like a Dominican. You bring that up. The, you bring that up in the book when you're talking book, about talking. the young girl giving birth. What is the two? What are the two phrases? Tell me that again. Um, dar a luz and um. Oh my gosh, now it's. It's, and in Mexican, it's something, Mexican different. it's something different. Well, it's Mexican also use that I lose. I think the point with the phrase is was that a that class. I lose. It was a class yeah. issue, right? Yeah, right. that it was. It's something that 
that one of Antonio's chestnuts that in Spanish is so much more beautiful the way you, you know, say, dar a luz, you give a child to the light. But it comes from, um, from times where upper class women did not, um, you know, they didn't labor, they didn't procreate. Uh, they gave to the light like the Virgin Mary. It was an airbrushing of the, of the body. Right. So what she finds is that even these beautiful words and things that we love and create sometimes are, you know, have their roots in class systems that we don't like very much. <laughs> so, so there's a teacher so, so there's on the a line who says line that, says um, that, um, that you, that, that you, my, she that teaches she my first teaches my free, first summer. free summer. Um, um and I know that and you connect to language, that language, you say language you say is the language only, is homeland the only homeland, homeland from what from this what woman remembers. This woman remembers. And, she goes, and she goes, how can I still this concept this in middle concept school in classrooms middle school. in its simplest form? The notion that language is, the, that may be too long for what you want to say, but language is the only homeland. I tell you what. Tell you know, you that, what. that is such a, di no, it's it just, it is, that is why. Um, I can only say essential workers, teachers, teachers of elementary school students, of middle school students um, who are trying to um, get kids interested in reading and writing. I mean, it's, it, it's an amazing skill and talent and one that, you know, um, it's a different set of skills at the college age different challenges, but that is, that is a, an, a task. And I think part of it, you know, it's not that you only have to read books by people like you, but a good, a good way to start is to have in your curriculum um, stories that reflect the kids that are you're introducing to reading, because then there's a, there's a, a connection that's happening. You don't have to build the bridge and, and, and the highway and the and the speed train to get them there. You know, if there's a character that's a Thea, you know, if there's a kid that's like them, then it's like, you know, there's something very engaging about a story that is a little bit like a mirror, too, you know. And then they can realize that literature is about a deeper mir mirroring as well. But that I think... I think getting stories and books um, by by what we call the multicultural curriculum is very important. You know, Julia, you know, I could talk to you talk all, you day, all day. day. We should probably make this a ritual somehow. But um, I just have to tell you that this has been spectacular to have you, you know, here virtually in my basically in my home. <laughs> And uh, in 2022, when the Spanish language edition comes out, or maybe even before then, we'd love to have you down once again uh, in real in person. And there is a, a statement that is a really beautiful way to end it. And there's someone on the on the who's watching who says this. It's not a question, she says, or he says. I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman, but says, as an American, as a Dominican American. Your books have been inspirational in my life. And growing up in New York with Dominican parents, uh, your books have, have made my life even that much more special. So that's a wonderful testament to what you've done. And as a uh, Jewish American kid who grew up on Miami Beach, I can say the very same thing, that this book, Afterlife, has in many ways changed the way I look at certain things. And it will help me go a long way to deal with my old age period in my own life. So I thank you for being a part of this. And if there was a way to give applause for all 300, 400 people who are on the line, I will do that for everybody. So thank you, Julia, for being a part of this. And, 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 Mitch, and Mitch, to you, um, to independent bookstores, uh, to the Miami Book Fair, and to you guys out there that I can't even see, you know, um, this is, it, thank you for hanging in there with all this, all these technology hitches. I really, really appreciate it. And you know, one thing that I've heard, a way that I've heard this pandemic time described, I thought, you know, maybe, 
maybe we, we readers have always known about this because reading has always been about being together apart. So we're with you, my readers. Thank you for being with me, even though we're apart. Um, and see you hopefully within the covers of Afterlife or one of the many books um, that are out there that I loiter in too. So <laughs> adios. Thank you. Thank you. Thank much. you, Julia. Thank you bye very, bye. very much. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.